Welcome to Veritas Group's webinar from $150 to $15,000, how to move a donor from mid-level to major gifts. I'm Rebecca Huron, Director of Content Marketing and Learning here at Veritas, and I'll be working behind the scenes to help you as Jeff and Kendra are presenting today. Um, before I have them introduce themselves, I do want to just uh, give you some information about our webinar system. So just because of the number of participants today, we're not going to be able to take your questions out loud, but we really want to hear from you. So please use the questions box for any sort of questions that you have as you're going along. We're going to take most of the questions at the end, but just put them in as soon as you have them so we can answer them. And then for any other interaction or engagement, please use the chat. Uh, the chat is not the right place for the questions just because it's really hard to keep track of that especially as people are getting uh, into the conversation. So please use the question box for questions and chat for engaging with everybody else on the call. At the end of the presentation, um, we will do our best to get to everybody, but may not get to all of the questions. So we will respond to you separately if we're not able to get to everything um, that you are asking today. And then we will also be sending you a link to the recording of the webinar, as well as a copy of the slides for you to download tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that in your email. And I think with that, I've covered all of my items. So Jeff, I will pass it on to you for an introduction. Great. All right. Well, there I am. Um, let's see. I've been doing this work for a long time, 33 years now. Um, first started working with in nonprofit uh, as a development director for eight years. I know what it's like to have to send out mail and take it to the post office and write the re get all the returns and the checks in the bank and all of that. Um, and uh, from there, went to work for an agency, a direct response agency. Uh, and that's where I met Richard Perry, who was the, is the founder of Veritas. And we started Veritas in 2009 and we've been going strong ever since and been having a ton of fun helping nonprofits really put together solid mid-major and planned giving programs. So that's me, Kendra. Hi, everybody. I am Kendra Loper, and I am one of the client experience leaders at Veritas. Fairly new to the Veritas team, but longtime uh, Veritas follower. And I, you know, was a frontline fundraiser for a few years and then led teams of of fundraisers. So really know all of the things that you are feeling and experiencing. Um, really thrilled to be on the Veritas team, helping our clients build their mid-level and major gift programs, really so that they can do more good in the world. And just honored to be here. Happy to be having this conversation today. Yeah. I've got to ask you, Kendra, how many different pairs of glasses do you have? Because <laughs> in your photo, you've got a yellow, you've got <laughs> kind of this greenish one. How many do you That's have? Right. Too many, you know, it's a good conversation starter for sure. If you've got to wear glasses, they might as well be fun. Yeah, I agree. All right. Now, before we get started on today's topic, I just wanted to share a bit about who we are at Veritas. Some of you on the call may be pretty familiar with us, but for those who aren't, our vision is to help nonprofits create a culture and a fundraising approach that creates transformational relationships with their donors. And this dynamic is critical to the system structure and strategy strategy that we have found to be successful in mid major and planned giving programs. We believe that for your organization to actually achieve your mission, you need to shift how you see these donors and their role in your organization, but that you also need to create partnerships internally and within your community. We've worked hard to ground our approach in objective fact, not just our personal opinion. We've formed our recommendations through insight from analysis of millions of donor records and the work we've done with thousands of fundraisers and leaders. And we've gotten to work with some pretty phenomenal organizations over the years who have helped us learn and develop our strategy and approach. We believe that mid-level programs are one of the best investments you can make right now. And one of the big reasons we believe this is because we have the pleasure of hearing firsthand the stories of donors who have never been spoken to become significant partners as a result of being connected with a mid-level officer 
And I can't wait to share a few of those examples as we continue. So with all of that in mind, our promise to you is this. If you follow our advice today, you'll set your organization up to create a successful mid-level program that will thrive, meet goals, move more donors into major gifts, and we'll talk a little bit about those numbers later. Over the years, we've had the pleasure of working with hundreds of nonprofit fundraisers and leaders, and we know how mid-level programs can really transform your work with those donors. In fact, we've calculated results for key clients. Before starting a mid-level program, they had a value attrition of 45%. And after one year, their average revenue had increased by 15%. That's a major swing from losing revenue to increasing revenue. And that's just one measurement. So to start things off, I want to talk about the root cause of why more of your donors are likely not giving to their full potential. So let's look at donor retention. And in our industry, as you all know, Donor retention has been a problem for years and it continues to go down. So we're not hanging on to donors. We're doing, we're spending all this money acquiring donors, but then we're not doing a very good job of, of keeping them and retaining them. So this has been a problem uh, for at least the last 10 years. And in the last five years, you, we've really seen, a, uh, really seen donor retention uh, go down. And now the other thing we want to measure is value attrition. So donor attrition is when you have a donor and the next year they stop giving. So they go away. That's donor attrition. Donor value attrition could be a combination of either a donor leaves and stops giving or a donor gives $100 one year and then gives 50 the next year. So we lo lose their value. We lost half of their value in one year. So we need to measure that value attrition. And you can see... And some of these donors here, like number the first donor, the first year they gave 10,000 and by the third year they gave 7,600. So we lost, you know, $2,400 in value by year three. That's value attrition. Another way to look at this, this is a, a an actual portfolio um, of 150 donors that we looked at. And you can see in year one, those donors brought in $1.9 million. By the third year, those same donors brought in 584,000, or we lost almost 70% of their total value from year one to year three. That's a huge amount of revenue we're losing. And many times we don't even know it. And here's why. So look at view number one. This is how most nonprofits look at the strength of their mid and major gift programs. In year one, you can see that this program brought 2.56 million. The next year, the program brought in 3.1 million or a 21% increase in revenue. So if you're the executive director or the development director, you're feeling pretty good about that 21% increase. But one of the things we wanna do is peel the onion back and look at what happened to those donors that we, that hap that we brought in in year one what would the, those same donors do in year two? So look at view number two, and you can see those donors that brought in 2.5 million, the next year, the same donors only brought in 1.3 million, or we lost 49% of their value in just one year. Now, the only reason this overall program grew by 21% is because new donors came in at one, almost 1.8 million, and masked the behavior of the donors that went away. And so all if we're just looking at bottom line, you're thinking we're doing pretty well. If you're looking at donor versus donor here, the same donors, you realize, wow, 49% uh, loss of value from those donors. What could we have done differently to actually curb some of that attrition? Maybe we're not going to get it all the way, but what if we could get half? That's another, you know, 700000 close to $600,000 in revenue that could go to program. So we're not usually viewing it that way. So this is what's happening in donor files and no one understands it or knows about it. Here's another way to look at it. This program grew from overall from $20 million to year one to $23.4 or 
we gained about 17% over three years. So not bad growth. I mean, you would still feel like, okay, well, at least we're growing overall in three years. But then again, when you break it down by individuals and look at it by giving year, you can see that from the individuals from one year, they went got brought in 10.5 million and those same donors by year three gave in 7.5 million. So we lost, you know, 29% of their total value. Then you look at the next class of donors. These are new donors that came in at 1,000 cube. They gave 3.1 million. The next year, those same donors gave in gave 1.78 million, or we lost 44% of their value. And then you could see the same thing with the organizations kind of masking what the individuals did. So if you look at all of it from one year to the next for three years, they lost $9.1 million to value attrition, 9.1 million. Now, when we showed this to the CEO of the, this organization, he, they were dumbfounded. They had no idea. And remember, they grew by 17% overall, but they didn't realize they actually lost, lost 9.1 million overall. And so the, obviously the CEO said this, what could we have done? I mean, if we could have just gotten half of that back, that's another four and a half million dollars for programs. Now, another little thing that's happening is when we look at the, the giving levels by QM levels, um, we can see that there are clogs in the pipeline, in the donor pipeline. And in this case, you see a clog in the 1,000 to 2,499 group. We often see it in this area. We, see, we can sometimes see it in the not 500 to 999 level. Sometimes we see it in the thousand to four thousand nine 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 level um but there's a clogs there are clogs on almost every file that we've looked at where donors are not giving um like they should as the other cum level donors do but the point here is that you want to know where those clogs are in your own donor pipeline so that you can pinpoint your mid-level strategies to those donors that's right, Jeff. It's so critical to know where those clogs are and where we might be losing yeah. um, along the way. And, you know, Jeff, I think it's so easy to think that only our major donors need to be reported back to or told that they're making a difference. But really, all of our donors need to know that they're making an impact. Too often donors fall into what you see in the red bubbles here they give a gift and we don't tell them what their gift did, and then they leave and give somewhere else. This is especially true of donors in the mid-level giving range because organizations often treat those mid-level donors really the same as a $10 donor. And you might be wondering what I mean by that. Well, they don't report back. And ultimately they aren't giving these donors an opportunity to be a part, a bigger part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And instead, you can see here in these blue bubbles, in a mid-level program, we wanna follow the blue bubbles. <laughs> and tell those donors personally about their impact and the true difference they're making so they'll want to help again. And ultimately, you know, we, we want to connect with these donors and learn more about their passions and interests so we can grow our relationship with them. I can tell you from experience, just this process of reporting back will show some really nice increases in giving. Our team at Veritas, we are always sharing our client stories where mid-level donors will su suddenly jump from five to $10,000 just because they're getting this personal impact information. In fact, in one organization we work with, a, a $1,000 donor recently made a commitment to a $250,000 gift. Can you imagine? That's incredible. So, you know, I think we have to ask ourselves some hard questions because I'm not sure we're always honest with ourselves, Jeff. I think mm. we, um, you know, m most organizations, we don't see ourselves as being transactional. I know for me early on in my fundraising career, I didn't see myself that way. And I thought I would describe myself as mission driven, relationship focused. But the truth was there were some systems in place, some transactional systems that really were a barrier to a deeper relationship with the donors I was working with. Here are just a few of the, the most common examples we see in a transactional fundraising practice. So you might have systems that really don't support the donor journey. 
This can be something like having a slow gift processing that delays your ability to quickly and properly thank that donor for their gift. Or maybe there's sticky internal processes that make that transition of a donor from direct mail to mid-level to major gifts just really challenging and clunky. Or you might only be communicating with donors about their giving. And this really means that your communication strategy is just out of balance. And or you you might just be relying on direct response rather than incorporating meaningful touch points that report back on impact, tell a changed life story, share the need. The goal here is to truly connect that donor to your mission. And now don't get us wrong, we love partnering with direct response. We just don't want you to rely on them. And you know, maybe you aren't incorporating the donor's communication preferences and interests into your communication strategy. And that might look like maybe a mandate that every donor in your on your caseload gets a particular marketing report, even if it doesn't relate to their interests. And lastly, this I see often, you might be pursuing money at the cost of those long-term relationships. This could sound like pressure coming from management to get as many of those gifts in before the end of the year as possible. And without really considering the donor or having a relationship um, as the focus. And Jeff, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of organizations who will hold an appeal for donors in their area of interest just so they can send a capital campaign ask without really ever considering what the donor actually gives to. That is really not the approach we want you to take. You know, staying in this transactional mindset can really have devastating effects on your organization and on your relationship with the donor. And here's some things you're likely to see if you don't move into a more relational focused approach. You might get some large gifts, but that donor is not going to feel honored or seen as a true partner. So you're going to struggle to build those long-term relationships. We had one client who shared a story of a $12 million donor, um, and that donor didn't hear anything from that organization for five years after that gift. When the new major gift officer came on the team and contacted him, that donor said, I just felt forgotten and unappreciated. No one even shared with me how the, how the funds that I provided for scholarships, how those students were doing. Can you even imagine not stewarding a $12 million donor? The bottom line is when you aren't properly nurturing your donor relationships, you're just gonna see minimal or even stagnant growth. So what does it look like when you move into a more relationship-focused strategy where you're treating your donors like true partners? Well, number one, you're going to honor that donor's inclinations, their communication preferences, their passions and interests throughout your strategy and communication with that donor. You're going to regularly re report back on the impact of the donor's give giving and really take the opportunity to celebrate that donor. If you hear nothing else, celebrate that donor. You see the donor as a part of the greater community that is coming together to achieve your mission. And you really do. You've heard this over and over. You see them as a partner in this work. Internally, when you're relationship focused, you're just not going to have those unhealthy competitions or silos that can show up. Everyone is working together to further the mission and really doing it as part of a community. Let me tell you a really quick story from one of my clients that just was so inspiring to me. The gift officer shared with me that he has a donor on his caseload that first gave over 10 years ago, his first gift at $150. The next gift that came in was a $2,000 gift just in November of 2023. When that gift officer saw that gift com coming in, he happened to be in the office. He was able to pick the phone right up give that donor a call within the first couple of hours after that gift came in. And since then, that gift officer has stayed in touch with that donor. He shared several meaningful touch points aligning with that donor's interests. Most recently invited him to a special event. The donor was so impressed with that special event that he asked for a tour and to meet with that gift officer and their CEO. The gift officer spent really about two and a half hours with that donor giving them the tour, getting to know him and his partner. And then about an hour after the meeting, the gift officer received the call that every gift officer wants, right? The donor letting him know that just how impressed they were 
And really that they particularly appreciated that he never made an ask. He really just spent time getting to know them, letting them ask a lot of questions, and they let him know that they would be making a $15,000 gift. And inc as incredible as that is, Jeff, it gets yeah. even better. This week, and this I think this fundraiser is on the call today, so shout out to you, my friend. Believe it or not, he received another an email from this donor letting them know that they would be making an additional $75,000 gift over the next three years. I don't know about you, but I was doing the happy dance with this gift That's officer. Okay. Just right. those intentional touch points. So imagine if this happened for 10, 50, or even 100 of your donors at your organization. The impact would be tremendous. So let's talk about what the system is that allowed this gift officer to develop an authentic relationship with this donor that motivated them to begin giving at a major gift level. So before we get into that, I just wanted to say, one, that's a great story. And think about $150 and now he's at $75,000 and all because you spent time, this gift officer spent the right amount of time, effort, figuring out what that person's passions and interests were. That is just, that's an amazing story. But here's, here's even better. And you know this, Kendra, we hear these stories all the time. Yeah. Like if you just look at our Slack channel of, of celebrations, how many mid-level donors are going from 500 to 5,000? We see it all the time. It's happening over and over again because we're finally reaching out to them and, and, and saying, hey, we, we know you're here and we thank you. Yep, it's yep. amazing. It's amazing. All right. So here's an overview of the Veritas way of mid-level fundraising which is our data proven system and structure for creating a relational mid-level program. This introduction series is a key step in the process of engaging with donors in mid-level. This series will help you learn if the donor does or does not want to engage, learn communication preferences, identify incorrect contact information, and hopefully begin to give you more information about the donor's passions and interests, because that's what it's all about. Now, keep in mind that this is happening over a long period of time. It can, in fact, take about six to seven months to connect with one third of the mid-level caseload. So along the way, you are mixing in outreach using mail, phone calls, email, small group video meetings, and other options as available to engage with donors and begin to build that relationship. And as you can probably see, many of these are similar to the kinds of communications used in major gifts work. So when you are thinking about what to do with your mid-level donors, the major gifts program can offer some great resources and ideas. Now, as you think about the one to some communication in mid-level, let's set some clear expect expectations and goals. So in mid-level, the goal is to learn passions and interests in an effort to build a two-way communication. And as such, you'll likely see giving increase. As part of that relationship building, like the story Kendra just shared, you'll also learn what you can do about the donor in order to identify which donors should move to the major gifts program. Let me remind you, that typically doesn't happen right away. It's a process. I remind my clients all the time, mid-level is a marathon, not a sprint. Our recommended caseload for mid-level is between 500 and 700 donors. Depending on a number of factors and the caseload is fluid, you'll have new donors coming on, some donors being moved off, some donors being promoted up to major gifts, and some mid-level donors um, being cultivated down by the direct response team. Now, within your mid-level program, it's important to recognize that about one in three donors out of your entire caseload will say yes to having a relationship with you. But this is, a val this is valuable information because a large role of the mid-level program is identifying which donors want to build a deeper relationship with your organization. If they want that relationship with you and their giving thresholds or capacity is at the major gift level, they're the perfect donor to move to the major gift program. And the MGO doesn't have to spend time qualifying them because, hey, you've already done that for them. 
So just to reiterate my earlier point, a major part of what you need to do before moving a donor into a major gifts is actually qualifying that donor. Also known as simply building a two-way connection with them, which can be done through a mid-level program. Now, tiering is an important part of your strategy because you only have so much time. And as someone who's managed a mid-level program, I know you're busy and you'll need to use that time wisely. Initially, tiering for mid-level is based on revenue. As you learn more about the donor, you can adjust the tiering to match the donor's interests, inclination, and capacity. Here's a visual to show what a tiered caseload will look like. You're going to see the fewest donors, obviously, in Tier A, because we'll spend most of that time with that group. And you're going to see our messaging for this group as, as most personal. Now, let's discuss another important part of mid-level program, and that's the communication plan. As you're creating your plan, there are some key things to do to help you manage your communication with mid-level donors in a manner that will prepare the donor for the kind of relationship he or she might have in the major gifts program. You'll want to tier the caseload similar to what I just shared with you and shift your plan according to tier. For example, you can see under phone touch point protocol that the protocol for calling starts with the most attempts to tier A and descends. This is to keep the focus on top tier donors who are most likely to move to major gifts while continuing to manage and engage with the rest of the caseload. This is a very similar approach to what we recommend for, with major gift caseloads. You want to mix different contact methods and types of interaction and engagement so that you are actively cultivating and stewarding your donors, showing them the impact of their gifts and learning more about their interests and putting opportunities in front of them. This was a critical part of how the gift officer, Kendra, shared about, was able to connect with this donor and move them from giving from 150 to 15,000 to 75,000. They were attentive to the donor's interests, shared the impact, provided relevant and valuable content. That's right. So Jeff, here's, a, here's an overview, really, of the various kinds of touch points we use in our communication plans to engage donors in different and meaningful ways. It's important to note that you don't want to just be sending out a bunch of touch points for the sake of sending touch points, right? You want to be sending out information that's relevant and of value to the donor. That's how you're going to get them to engage with you and really build trust. Our mid-level programs serve as an important role in identifying donors to move to major gifts. Mid-level officers have to pay really close attention to those key indicators that a donor may be interested in a deeper relationship with the organization. And really the top two key indicators, which we touched on earlier, are gonna be their giving. Have they moved into a major gift giving threshold and how deep a relationship they're interested in having with your organization. You know, a part of our process is to create what we call business protocols to outline every aspect of your system and structure, including how to transition those donors to major gifts. There needs to be really strong collaboration and cooperation for this to be successful and, and respectful to the donor. You know, one of the most common questions, Jeff, that I get from clients is around this very topic. I like to remind our clients that if they keep the partnership with the donor at the very center of that conversation, it actually can feel really good to move them to an, another uh, major gift officer on the team because it's not about moving them to another person, but more importantly, it's about transitioning them to someone who can really serve as a subject matter expert in their area of interest. Now, it's important to note also that this structure is really only successful if you have the right support. The most important thing is that your CEO and your fundraising leadership must fully back this program. They need to create a culture that understands the role of mid-level where everyone is collaborating together to support the donor journey and where the fundraising team is dedicated to, you know, staying accountable, right? We have to stay accountable to the structure. And, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, this all sounds great, <laughs> but is this relational approach to mid-level fundraising really better than maybe an enhanced mail campaign? 
Well, let's take a look at that and see what the impact is of a focused mid-level uh, program can have. Now, everything we've been saying, again, it might seem nice, but I really, if I want you to walk away hearing that this works, we know it works. And this is why mid-level has been such a hot topic for the past few years. You've seen it out there. Everywhere you look, we're talking about mid-level. When we look at the results from our clients, we can clearly see that a focused mid-level program with a dedicated mid-level officer yields ongoing and impactful results. And, you know, Jeff mentioned we've worked with a lot of nonprofits and we've been doing mid-level work for many years. And when we look at the data of our organizations who do not have mid-level programs, you, you might see about a 0.2 to 1.2% of those donors moving to major gifts. No wonder so many fundraisers and leaders think they need to look elsewhere to prospect for those major donors. But when a mid-level program is implemented, you can expect to see three to three and a half percent of your donors moving up to major gifts, which means, Jeff, you could see the number of good qualified major donors almost double when you implement a robust major or mid, mid-level program. Exactly. Exactly. So let me ask you, those who are listening, if I had a way to teach you how to develop a mid-level program that would move more of your donors into major gifts, raise your hand if you'd be interested. Okay, so I can see a lot of hands uh, raised here. Well, I want to say that our next offering of the certification courses in mid-level fundraising starts on April 22nd and provides a comprehensive training on the system and structure you can implement to create and grow a successful mid-level program by hiring and retaining the right mid-level officer, establishing critical data systems, and integrating the fundamentals for effectively and efficiently managing the mid-level caseloads, including evaluation and reporting and how to smoothly transition donors to major gifts. Here's a note from a Veritas Group uh, Academy alumna about how this course impacted her organization's mid-level program. And what ba Beth is basically saying is that this course gave her everything she needed to create a successful mid-level program because the process and structure we teach helps you identify your donors' passions and interests. Now, if you're looking to grow or start a mid-level program and take your work with donors to the next level, this is really a course you don't want to miss. And if you want to get the $200 off of your upcoming course, which starts April 22nd, go to veritasgroup.com slash courses, select certification courses in mid-level fundraising, and use the coupon code midlevel200 on the registration page. Rebecca, now is a great time to take some questions from folks. Um, I would All love right. It. I'm sure Kendra and I are... We'd love to be ready to go. Yeah, ready. Thank you both so much for all of this great content. That was that was wonderful and just such an inspiring story. So Kendra, thank you for sharing us with that, um, sharing that with us today. Just as a reminder, if you do have questions, you can keep popping them into the Q and A box. I know I've got several, so I'm going to start going through those. But um, if you could put those there versus in the chat, that would be great. And before I get to questions, just a reminder that we will share a copy of the slide deck and a uh, link to the recording via email tomorrow. So you'll get an email. It will give you a link in that. You'll click that link. It will take you to both the slide deck and the recording. So that information is to come. Um, we had a great, well, we have a, a number of really great questions. So okay. I'm going to uh, kick things off, actually taking us back to the beginning of the presentation. So Jeff, this is a question I'm going to direct to you. Um, okay. Sally was just asking a little bit more about value attrition and how we would look at value attrition, especially when you're in a campaign versus not necessarily in the midst of a standard campaign. I, a lot of people had questions just about yeah. the analysis that we do. So when we do our donor analysis, we will ask some questions prior to doing the analysis. And one of those is, have you had any kind of capital campaign recently or you know, an emergency where you would start to see um, donor behavior that's not necessarily normal. So what we do, what you do need to take into a, uh, account is when you do have 
like a capital campaign. And then all of a sudden you see giving really high. And then the next year, it just like, it sound, feels like it tanks and you'll have a lot of value attrition going on. You have to take that into an account because uh, what you want, what you want to do is try to take the campaign out of the overall, because you want to get an overall trend. You don't want a campaign or an emergency to skew the giving. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to get into some of these mid-level specific questions. Um, we had a question uh, related to the fact that, you know, it takes more than just a gift officer to launch a mid-level program, as we alluded to in the presentation today. Um, so the question is, who else on staff needs to be involved in that process? Yeah. Kendra, do you want to take that yeah. or do you want me to take it? Yeah. You can go. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll jump in and add what I miss for sure. So, you know, I think it, it might depend on your organization and what your structure is. So, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to, you know, get a sense of who the decision makers are at your organization. And, you know, we've got a tremendous amount of resources available on our website that you could share with those decision makers to say, here are some things that I'm thinking, here's why I want to look at implementing a mid-level program um, and, you know, make sure that they understand the value. Yeah. Here's what I would, I would add to that is you need everyone. <laughs> I mean, what the beautiful thing about mid-level is that it brings together major gifts and your direct response team, because you need both of them because mid-level is that bridge between both, both the mid-level or excuse me, the, the direct response program and major gifts. And so when we work with a client, all everyone comes around the table. You'll need the database people. You'll, you need program people to understand how they need to report on impact. And if, if you're not, if you don't get that, you definitely need it for mid and major gifts, but um, you, you really need everyone around the table. And then you want to make sure that leadership is bought into this. Um, because if they're not, it's it's going to be tough to make it work because they're going to want to expect results like immediately. And that's not what it's about. Mid-level is about moving. It's about keeping donors, number one. It's about increasing their revenue overall per donor. but And then ultimately moving as many of those donors into major gifts. And it takes time. It takes at least 12 to 18 months to really get that program going. So leadership needs to be on board with that. Great. Um, let's see here. So we do have a question from a couple of people about, um, you know, their one person development office, uh, officers, or they have a very small uh, nonprofit with a lot of like volunteers really supporting the development function. So what's some advice on how they could be able to incorporate a mid-level strategy and what would we recommend for a really small organization? Yeah. Go for it, Jeff. Okay. So it's really, uh, it's really tough. We get this question a lot and I understand it because I've been in your shoes. I've been a one person shop too. The way to make this work is really to understand all the different avenues that you're bringing in revenue from major gifts, mid-level direct response, and you have to allocate your time correctly on each of those. Now, obviously, you're going to focus more on the highest ROI uh, area. So major gifts would come first, mid-level, and then down to the direct response. But you need them all because it all feeds into one another. But I would try to determine, okay, how much, what percent of your time is on mid-level? And let's just say it's 20% of your time. Well, you know that a full-time person can handle between five to 700. So if you're only working 20%, you're talking maybe a hundred donors that you'd have to tier and everything else, but that's about all you can work on with 20% of your time. If it's 10% of your time, 50 donors, you know? But the point is, is that no matter what, you can work, you can have a mid-level program and a major gift program with a one-person shop. It's just a matter of how you allocate your time and how many donors you can work in each area so that you're not overwhelmed. 
Yeah, and I have several clients who do have a mixed caseload um, like that. So they're working major gifts and mid-level at the same time. And it, it does get challenging, right? You're wearing a lot of hats as a fundraiser in a small shop. You've yeah. got to just really know that the value of working those mid-level donors is creating that pipeline for your major gifts. So even though you're you're prioritizing that work with those higher ROI donors, you you've got to also do that mid level work to build that pipeline of having those. You're not you're not having to go out and search for those new mid level or major gift donors. They're in your your mid level work. They just need to be identified and cultivated. Yep. Awesome. That's very helpful. So we have a question from Ashley about whether or not there are times where we might recommend that a mid level officer hang on to a relationship with a donor uh, that they've maybe successfully, you know, qualified at that point. They might be ready for major gifts, but we would actually recommend that they not transition to a major gift officer. So um, could you speak a little bit to some of the circumstances um, where we would recommend that? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. I think, you know, again, we want to keep the donor at the center of every decision we're making. And so we want to do what's best for the donor. And if the donor's best served by staying with a particular gift officer, then we might make that decision to do that. But again, you know, there there is a purpose and a plan for a, for a mid-level program. And if you're spending your time trying to engage those those major gift donors and you're and you're doing a really personalized plan you know that we would recommend for a major gift officer then that's going to take away from some of your mid-level um, work and so you have to really think through what is in the best interest of this donor and if we if even if it's uncomfortable or challenging to move them to another officer you've built you've spent so much time trying to get to know them, deepening your relationship. Sometimes that can be hard, right? To let those folks go to another person, but you have to think it's not about me. It's about mm -hmm. the donor and what's in the best interest of that donor. Yep. Absolutely. And I know, you know, we've had circumstances as well where maybe there's a group of donors that are ready to move to major gifts, but the major gift officer's caseload is full. And so they wait for maybe a caseload refresh to happen to see, you know, at that point in time that they're ready. So it might be that you're holding on to them and just delaying that process a little bit. Um, so there are certainly circumstances, but the ideal flow is that they move from the mid-level officer to the major gift officer's caseload um, as yeah. smoothly as possible. And that's all that's, outlined in the protocols. That's a really good point, Rebecca, and something we haven't really talked a whole lot about, but once you move them, actually before you move them to major gifts, make sure that there is a plan not just about introducing the new play person, but then a, a really a stage plan for how you're going to communicate with that donor. Because we've heard some horror stories where a great mid-level donor is ready to go to a major gift officer and the major gift officer puts them on as their tier C level donor and they, they don't talk to them that, that much. And so now they were getting all this great communication and now they get hardly anything. And so there needs to be a plan for really uh, bringing them into that portfolio and helping them feel like they're part of that family. Absolutely. That's really important. Um, so kind of going on the flip side from the conversation that we were having about small nonprofits, we also had a question about um, when you have a mid-level program that's on a large scale. So this question says, um, do you have any examples of how we would accomplish this kind of personalized non-transactional stewardship when maybe you have 10,000 or more mid-level donors? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have. We've, we've worked <laughs> with many organizations that have more than 10,000 mid-level donors. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that's where you really have to work very closely with your direct response and your communication team at your organization and in your planning stages of, okay, what are, what is communication sending out? And then looking at all the donors and tiers, okay, what level of personalization are we going to send out for A, B, and C, but you all have to coordinate that together with the direct response team, any other communications that you have going on so that you're in sync with everything that's going out to a donor, because just because when they're in mid-level, they're still getting all the direct response stuff. 
it's a matter of looking at what can we personalize some of those impacts. Um, so it's very important when you have a big program like that, that you're in sync with all the other teams that are sending out communications to donors so that you're not, so that you're really uh, in, in, in sync with one another. Right. So yeah, I have a question about major donors. So major donors that are um, connected to the organ or giving to the organization, but they don't have a strong relationship with anyone. They're not necessarily what we would consider qualified for a major gift caseload. So how do we suggest, and we've had this, you know, come up with mid-level programs, you know, what do we suggest for how you can build a relationship maybe with an unengaged major gift officer through your mid-level program? So you're saying, how can we use the mid-level program to engage the donor that hasn't been engaged in major gifts? Yes. Okay. Um, well, that's where that introductory series happens. So what you're trying to do is introduce yourself and you're trying to, a number of of touch points over that course of the next you know few months to get them to engage and help them realize somebody um, cares about them, wants to connect with them, and and uh, see if that donor actually does want to engage. And I can give you a, a real life example from one of my clients just today. You know, she has a donor on her caseload that's been on her caseload. She's new to the organization, but she's been there about a year. And she's been trying every way she knows to try to get in contact with this donor and no response, no response, no response. And she just, they just started working with us, with Veritas. She's been walking through her intro series. She sent out an introduction letter, right? Mm -hmm. She hadn't done that. She had used the phone and email and tried to just make contact. She sent out an introduction letter. And then a week later, she made a phone call and that donor picked up. And it was the introduction letter, interestingly enough, that you know, triggered her, hey, I'm going to be calling you in about a week. I want to make sure you know who I am. I'm your point of contact. I'm not calling to ask you for any gifts. I just want to get to know you and understand why you're supporting this organization. So again, it's that whole process of don't give up, <laughs> never give up on these donors, right? They they just, they're not on our timetable. And we have That's to remember right. their lives are busy. Things are going, we're sending emails and they're top of mind for us, but we're not always top of mind for them. And the point is to to help us get to top of mind for them. Yeah. That's why there's at least seven touches. Right. And I would, you wouldn't believe how many fundraisers have come up to us and said, I'm so glad we had that structure of the seven because I would have given up at like two, okay. <laughs> but a lot of donors finally connected with me on the fifth or sixth try. And so I'm so glad we had the discipline to actually do it because otherwise I would have given up. Absolutely. Yeah, we hear that a lot. And kind of a related question. Um, we have a question from Jason just about the mid-level communication plan and how that relates to the introduction series. Um, so if you could maybe just speak for a moment about how those two kind of match up with each other, Kendra uh, can give that question to you. You bet. Happy to. So typically we, we want to, uh, you know, introduce ourselves to those donors first, get to know them, ha find out why they're giving to our organization, learn more about them. Once we well, once we relationally qualify those donors, we get to know them, we have some two-way communication, then we start them on that communication plan, right? So we build a communication plan, we decide which tier, they've been tiered initially based on their giving, but maybe we learn something in the conversation that, ah, I really think they're in a B, but I really think they need to be an A, they need a little more personal touch, they're really interested, they're really leaning in. And I want to make sure they get a, a higher personal touch. And so we begin that process. So it's really important that we start with the introduction process and then we start our series of touch points. Does that answer the question, Rebecca? Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have a quick kind of baseline question. Um, so Jeff, I'll just give this to you because I know you've done a lot of assessments that give us this information, but we have a question about about what we consider to be a mid-level donor. So I know it varies by organization, but if you can just give a baseline. Yeah, I, it does vary. So if you're a small organization, it could be somewhere between $250 and $999.99. 99 
if you're a larger organization, it could be a thousand to nine thousand, or it's a thousand to four thousand nine nine nine. Um, it just depends on the size of your organization, and if you do that uh, donor pipeline analysis, which comes with the analysis that we do, you'll be able to see where that mid level is for your organization. Um, it's very clear when you do the pipeline analysis, where that mid-level is. Um, but it's important to find it out. And then you'll notice these clogs too, like we said earlier. And then you'll see, okay, this is the area to focus. Because once we start working these donors, you'll start to see that clog diminish and um, start seeing more donors flowing up to mid major gifts. Absolutely. So we have a question uh, about any tips that we would give to a leader who is managing someone uh, who is brand new to the organization as a mid-level officer. Who wants it? <laughs> <laughs> well, from my point, my perspective, I would say you need to have patience and understanding that this is not something that you're going to see a ton of revenue overnight. Um, you will see wins. We do. We see that all because, like Kendra uh, said earlier, you know, just just starting to talk to them and thanking donors, and because you'll get these, you'll do these calls, and donors are like, "No one's ever called me before. Right. I've never heard from anyone from your organization." And if it's, and so that's number one. You'll start to see some gifts come in, anecdotal, all this, but to expect that the program is just going to like ch change everything. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to take time. And remember this mid-level thing is really to move these donors through the pipeline. And so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the, the movement of donors, uh, you, their revenue per donor will go up, their retention rates will go up. And most importantly, you'll see a higher percentage moving into major gifts. So if you're a leader, that's where the perspective you need to have. And, and be sure to make sure that they have adequate training. I, I think that is so critical for me when my very first fundraising job, I was sort of thrown to the wolves, like figure it out, right? No system, no plan, you know, and I just had to <laughs> use my own resources. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a go-getter, but I still had no idea. And then all of a sudden I came into an organization that was using the Veritas way and began to understand, oh, this is what it looks like when you really have a plan and you can look at in a linear, you know, a linear view, like, okay, here's how I really get to know donors and, and reinforce that value of the relationship, right? As Jeff said, there's this pressure, right, around these revenue numbers. And that's always going to be a part of who we are as fundraisers. We, we're raising money to support these incredible missions. But the donor comes first, right? The goal, I, my colleague has said this over and over, the goal is never money. The goal is to build and deepen that relationship with the donor, make sure that their passions are aligned, and then the money will follow, right? It's about really deepening that relationship. And Fundraisers just need training. There's so many fundraisers who haven't had the adequate training to get to where they need to be. So, yep. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. So, we have a, a question from Caroline about what we would recommend or how we recommend engaging individuals that fall just below the criteria for mid level. Well, I think it, again, it might depend somewhat on the organization and, and, how many, what else you're doing besides mid-level, right? So I saw a question just pop up. I have a, a client who has a, actually does have a tier D um, and they're just below that threshold. And so as she's moving donors up to major gifts, we're, we're looking at that tier D and we're, we're, we're sort of hitting them with the direct response. We haven't pulled them out, right? We never recommend them pull out of direct response. So they're getting those touches, but we're just paying attention to them. We're watching what's happening with the revenue, is there anything changing that maybe shows me that they might have an inclination and, you know, should I think about moving them up to a tier C? Mm -hmm. That would, that would be my advice, but you know, it might depend on how many donors you're managing, what else, you, what mm -hmm. other responsibilities you have in the organization. Yeah. For some of our larger clients, 
some of the things they do is, well, one, make sure that their direct response program is really talking to them in their giving levels. So instead of, instead of talking to them like they're a $25 donor, acknowledge the type of giving that they've done in the past, and then also what they recommend asking for. You know, in other words, you don't take a $500 donor who's not yet in the mid-level program and ask them for $50. So that's one thing. The other thing that some of the larger organizations that we work with have done is for those that are just under mid-level, they might put together a caseload of 1,000 to 1,500 donors, and they have a calling program and thank you program. So if one of those donors gives a gift, they will get a message and someone will call them. And so that they're at least getting some kind of interaction. Great. Um, I have seen a couple of questions just about sample language. Um, I just wanted to quickly note that we do provide sample language in our certification course. And then we also have a free community hub where we have some discussion spaces where people are sharing ideas and asking questions. And so those are both great resources. If you want to join the course, we've got some really wonderful examples there, but also the free hub um, and community spaces are great examples if you're wanting um, to look for some sample language. So just to know, because I've seen a couple of those. Um, we have a really interesting question. I'm curious, Jeff, um, about your thoughts on this. So Gary asked what our opinion is on including an events coordinator in the structure of mid-level programs. I mean, if you, I'm trying to understand what, what he's getting to. I would say, yeah, include them into the overall strategy of your mid-level program because you want to know like what are all the events and where would it be appropriate to include mid-levels mid-level donors into those events so yeah when you're when you're planning out that 12 month communication plan for those donors if you've got an events coordinator or team you definitely need to have them at the table because you'll want to know what is all planned and what's appropriate for a mid-level donor to to kind of uh, squeeze into those uh, those events. So yeah, absolutely. So we do have a question about direct response. And while direct response is not necessarily our wheelhouse, Jeff, I know that you and I both come from direct response worlds and obviously mid-level uh, engages a lot with direct response. The question is about what does a healthy direct response program look like? And I'm wondering if you could answer that kind of in relation to how does it support a mid-level program? A healthy direct response program has the correct investments in acquisition and cultivation so that you can see that donors, one, that, you, that you're that you effectively acquiring donors at a cost that you will be able to know that, how, that within 18 to 24 months, normally, you'll be able to recoup the cost of acquisition. So in other words, you're going to lose money at the cost of acquisition. Most nonprofits do. But if you're good at this, you'll know exactly how long does it take to recoup that cost. The other thing is to have a strong cultivation program to retain as many of those donors that you're acquiring. So you're spending all this money on acquisition. What are you doing on the retention side, the cultivation side, and a good uh Direct response cultivation program is bringing in anywhere three to four to one ROI. So for every dollar you're spending, you're getting at least three and a half, four dollars out of that. And that's what's fueling the mid-level. You know, you got a sustainer program, hopefully, that you're getting monthly gifts. You've got a mix of those kind of donors and they're moving up the pipeline. And that's what you're wanting to see. And that you're adequately funding all stages of that pipeline. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering all of the questions. And thank you everyone here for sending in your questions. These were really great. And it was wonderful to have you all actively participating in the conversation. A huge thank you to Jeff and Kendra for such a fabulous presentation today. Um, I just want to remind all of you that you can get $200 off when you register for the certification course that starts on April 22nd. You'll use the coupon code MIDLEVEL200 at checkout. 
um, to do that. And then tomorrow you will get an email with the recording link and the slide deck um, and some reminders about the coupon code. So if you didn't write it down, don't worry. Um, and then we really hope to see you in a course soon. Thank you all so, so much. And we will talk to you again soon.